I uh, sort of polled the internet. Uh, a bunch of folks I was tweeting, I was like, hey, I'm going to be at WeWork. Talk about whatever they want me to talk about. I got 30 minutes, so just submit to this Reddit thread what you want me to talk about and vote up the best stuff and I'll talk about it. And everything people submitted was tell us stories from Reddit and from Hitmonk. So that's what I'm going to do. Except this time, I'm going to use a lot more profanity. And I hope, I hope, because you guys have all been drinking, uh, and you're also, I presume, into startups. Uh, is there anyone here who's not in any way interested in changing the world through technology? Great. Even if you aren't, that's fine too. That's fine too. You're more than welcome. Um, so here's the thing. The general theme, uh, and, and this, this sort of entrepreneurial career of mine uh, got started fresh out of college. So UVA graduate, Wahoo Wah. Any? Hey, all right. All right, representing. Yes. So my buddy Steve Hoffman and I graduated in 2005. And we were in the first round of Y Combinator, a seed stage accelerator that back then no one had ever heard of. It was in Boston, started by this super nerd, Paul Graham, who we all revered. And we had no fucking clue what we were doing. And this is a theme. This is a theme that I'm going to continue throughout this and that I want to stress. We had no fucking clue. And it was, in fact, one of our greatest assets uh, because it was about two weeks after we launched. We got this thing, reddit.com online, and good God, it was ugly. It was really heinous. Some would argue it hasn't gotten much more attractive. <laughs> but the value there was that Steve and I may not have had web design skills. And remember, it was 2005, so the bar was set much lower back then. Um, we didn't have web design skills, but we knew, at the very least, we needed to create a product that had value, that someone could come to and instantly find out what was new and interesting online. And about two weeks after we launched, fresh out of college, uh, we heard about a site called dig.com. DI, that's two G's, dot com. It was launched by a guy, a sort of a television celebrity named Kevin Rose, months earlier. He had announced it on his TV show, brought his following of fans, raised a round of venture funding, had hired someone with CSS skills, <laughs> and we were, we were terrified. Uh, I remember the email that I sent to Steve just had a subject line, meet the enemy. I was, I was trying to muster as much bravado as I could. Then it was dig.com. And I hit send, and I'd CC'd our chief investor, Paul Graham. And the first thing he said back was, don't worry, it's fine. Competitors will never defeat you, only you will defeat yourselves. And it was a very kind of zen thing for him to say. And at the time, we were, we were just a little pissed off and disappointed that I guess I hadn't really done the competitive analysis that I should have before we launched our product, which admittedly was similar in a lot of ways. But our ignorance was so helpful. And I don't normally, I don't normally trumpet ignorance. I think there's too much of that already happening in most of the world. Uh, but ignorance in this instance was very helpful because we didn't know that it needed to be a certain way to be a social news website. If you looked at every one of the Dig clones, and there were scores of them, including a very infamous one by Jason Kalkanis uh, called Propeller or Netscape, depending on the week, um, they all just copied what the leader was doing. They all just followed. They didn't have something that was built on their own. They weren't innovating. They just copied, and they're all gone. I think that had a lot to do with the reason we were successful because we just didn't have a blueprint, we just simply figured what's the easiest way to have links rise and fall, bubble up and down. And we also thought, yeah, you know what, we only need to raise 72, uh, sorry, $82,000 in funding. I'm just going to repeat that. The only funding that Steve and I raised for reddit.com was $82,000. That was it. We were not ramen profitable, we were never that. <laughs> we were barely hummus profitable because I prefer that to ramen. It's much healthier. And frankly, I think just a better decision. It's also pretty cheap. You can also make your own. Um, we got by because that's all we knew. We didn't, we didn't really actually know what it was like to have a salary. We didn't pay ourselves anything for this 18 months that we worked on Reddit. We, we had enough beer and enough pizza and we had servers, which back then we actually had to order off of Newegg. God, I can't believe I'm the old curmudgeon now. We had to order them off of Newegg to our apartment in Somerville, Massachusetts, put them together, and walk them over to a co-location facility and set them up. Now, kids these days just have a credit card, AWS account. It's so easy, but that's so awesome, right? The barriers fall. It's so much easier to get started. We had a little differently. The point is, we worked and we worked, and we didn't really know what the rest of the world was like uh, in a lot of ways. Um, because we were in a startup community in Boston that was still very insular back then. Uh, something that always shocks people is that Steve, <laughs> Steve and I, uh, you know, despite all the work that we put into Reddit back then in 05, didn't have a single publication write about us until December of 2005. So we launched June 2005. It wasn't until December. 
but six months later, and it was <laughs> a lovely tech rag called The Guardian. All right, a British newspaper, an awesome British newspaper, which is one of the few that still holds to a thing called journalism, um, was actually the first one to write about Reddit, a little startup started by some EVA grads in Somerville, Massachusetts. We literally were not on TechCrunch until the day we got acquired. We never once were covered by TechCrunch, which some of you may remember back in 2005 was the sort of dominant tech news blog. Not once were we covered. Not once until we got acquired. And I see startups today. I'm an investor in about 60, 65 companies. And, I, and I, I talk to startups all the time. I love it. It's a wonderful gift that I have this job, that I get to just take coffee with people who are making things and try to help them. And it breaks my heart. I always, 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 always beg founders not to build things to get on the front page of TechCrunch and not consider that in any way an accomplishment. And that's not to particularly rag on TechCrunch or whatever the top tech blog is today. I don't even know. Um, you can't be building things for these momentary press hits because those won't last. If you aren't actually building a product that people want, a product that people love, those hits will go away, that traffic will fall, and you'll spend months trying to catch that one brief momentary peak when your Google Analytics went all the way up and then came crashing back down, because it always does. It maybe gets a little higher afterward, but still, just, just up and down. So we didn't know that you were supposed to care because we weren't in the middle of Silicon Valley. We weren't in the middle of that echo chamber, which has a lot of virtues. I mean, I spent two years living in San Francisco. Um, it has much better Mexican food. It does. Let's just concede that. I want to... I want to put out a, an offer for some of you to hopefully work on startups or patronize restaurants that will help change that and bring burritos back to the East Coast, all right? Because that's the only thing they've got over us, and uh, we can turn the tide. Um, am I showing my bias here? I was made in Brooklyn. I live in Ed's. Come on. All right, so, so that was a little bit of Reddit, and I, I will be doing uh, a little Q&A after this if you want to dig deeper, but, but that was an important lesson, and I still see it happening today because there are more and more tech publications. I don't know if you've noticed, there have been some big movies in Hollywood about startups. Um, uh, there's a social network. Literally weeks after that movie came out, I saw my inbox double in blind emails from people who said, yo, dude, I've got this great idea for a startup. Just help me find an IT guy. And the problem is, there are lots of problems. Lots of problems with that sentence. It was a run-on sentence, first of all, which is just bad grammar. But also, this is, I mean, not enough people think about this stuff, okay? But also, uh, you, <laughs> you had a lot of people who looked to me as a non-technical founder. In case I didn't make it very clear, Steve built Reddit. I would draw silly mock-ups and do a little CSS, but he actually built the thing. Without someone who has the ability to code, you're really just someone who has ideas. And guess what? Everyone has ideas. And they're all awesome. Does anyone ever say, oh, I have this terrible idea, let me share it with you? But no. <laughs> Everyone thinks they have brilliant ideas, and until you can actually build something out of it, they're just a fucking idea. So, another little venture called Bread Pig. Uh, this is a sort of social enterprise that I started in the model of Newman's Own, mostly because a friend of mine, Randall Monroe, who publishes a wonderful webcomic called XKCD, wanted to make a book. Every publisher in town, if you don't read XKCD, you should. It'll improve your life by at least an order of magnitude of joy, I promise. Every publisher in town wanted to publish this because this webcomic is read by literally millions of people every day. And it's a great story, too, because, of course, he didn't have to worry that his math jokes would go over the heads of the same people who laugh at Family Circus. Because, really, who the fuck laughs at Family Circus? But <laughs> think about how much more awesome it is knowing that someone who wants to make math jokes and jokes about love and romance doesn't have to worry about offending someone or confusing someone on the Sunday comics page. Because for centuries, that was the only way you were going to be a cartoonist, right? Is you could create it, but make sure no one's going to get upset or confused by your math jokes. <laughs> There are all kinds of anecdotes I could tell you there, but Randy wanted a book. And I said, listen, dude, I don't know a fucking thing about publishing a book. But I didn't know a fucking thing about starting a website. Or... Turns out I didn't know a fucking thing about it, but I could learn. And I found people who were willing to tell me this is how books get printed. This is how you talk to a printer. This is how you talk to a designer. They'll create a PDF and they'll send it. It's actually just a lot of steps that one can follow. And it turned out we were able to publish a book. We've, we've published about six or seven now. The most recent, thanks to Kickstarter, is a choose-your-own-adventure version of Hamlet, written by the author of Dinosaur Comics, Ryan North. That book, at the time, I don't know if it still is, was the highest-grossing Kickstarter publishing project to date and raised, if I remember correctly, a little over $600,000. And I should also mention, the author gets the vast majority of those profits because obviously that's what they deserve. They've always deserved that. It's just the publishing industry has not always been so kind. So. 
And what does all this mean? It simply means, one, we're living in a very interesting world where people are starting to realize that the little that they know about doing something is actually incredibly empowering. Incredibly empowering, thank you. That fact is interesting because for the longest time, we have been told that there is a certain way to do things. There has been a convention. And if we succumb to it, then we won't really create anything new. And every single one of you has to embrace the fact that, yeah, there's lots of stuff you don't fucking know. And in fact, when you hear people like me in front of you with the microphone, you are seeing the product of eight and a half years of not knowing what the fuck I'm doing and learning. <laughs> and still not knowing what the fuck I'm doing. Every day I'm trying to get into ventures where I don't know what I'm doing because that's the kind of curiosity that drives us forward. And all the people that inspire me are continuously trying to find themselves in situations where they don't know what the fuck they're doing. And it's incredibly empowering. I'll give you one other example. A little travel search website called Hitmonk, which my Reddit co-founder Steve and our friend Adam Goldstein started back in 2010. Now they asked me to join about a week before we launched to create the mascot, because I draw mascots for all the companies I helped start. You don't have to, but I love doing it. And I very, very happily drew a little chipmunk, and I watched as, you know, I got, I, obviously I was talking to Steve rather often, and I saw this at the start of their three-month venture. They were gonna build a new travel search website. And it seemed a little ambitious because travel sucked. That industry is terrible. No one wanted to innovate in it. So many of the major players, airlines, are perpetually going out of business. Not the best place to start. But Adam, who had just graduated from MIT and had no business landing deals with major airlines or online travel agencies, was getting on planes and going to cities like Chicago to try to make this happen. We couldn't launch without actually having airlines in the system, right? It's, travel search website isn't that great if you <laughs> want to book a flight from New York to San Francisco, well, from New York to uh, anywhere else. From New York to <laughs> New Orleans, there's a great city. From New York to New Orleans, and you don't get any search results. So here we were, Y Combinator's demo day was coming up. It had been about three months of building code, but not actually getting anyone signed up. Couldn't launch without any search results, but we needed to do it. So Adam finds a way to keep flying in to Chicago, which is where a, a lot of the major airlines and online travel agencies, OTAs, were headquartered. And he would just show up in Chicago, and he'd find excuses to be there. The pizza's wonderful. Um, but he would find excuses to be there and send quick emails to M&A guys, or not to M&A guys, to, to biz dev guys and gals, and say, hey, look, I'm in town. I, I've only got an hour, but I'd totally love to meet you for coffee. And he kept trying, he kept trying. And finally, he gets in the door. He gets a meeting. Now. He was very deliberately coming to Chicago and setting these artificial time constraints <laughs> to try to get meetings he had no business being in because he just graduated from MIT. This was just an MIT whiz kid with a dot-com idea from Silicon Valley. And he managed to pull it off, I think in large part because he didn't know how much he didn't have a fucking, or he, he knew exactly how little he knew. And, and he knew how little, oh damn it, that's like a Donald Rumsfeld quote. <laughs> He, <laughs> he had no clue what he was doing because he didn't think that it was we he didn't think that it was weird for some brazen 21 year old to take meetings with biz dev guys who'd worked their whole careers and expected to be talking to people much older. In fact, one of his best hacks and one of my favorite ones that I pass on to founders today is if you think your youth will be a disadvantage, make those first conversations over a phone, make them over email, and then when you meet them in person, they're shocked because holy shit. Holy shit, you're so young. It actually becomes a strength at that moment because they've been talking to you for all those weeks thinking, ah, here is someone who is brilliant, hardworking, has been surely in this industry for much longer, and now it's a strength. So here is instance after instance after instance. And I'll tell you, the internet's kind of cool. And I don't think it's a fad. And what's so important about that, really, it's not a fad, it's sticking around. What is so important and what is so amazing about that is the fact that it is, as uh, Mark Andreessen says, it is eating the world. Software is eating the world, and the internet is, is sort of delivering so much of that software. And that is so great because it's disrupting a lot of things we don't yet understand. It's disrupting a lot of things that historically have been done a certain way. Whether it was travel search, whether it was book publishing, whether it was finding and sharing photos of cats. Um, there are, which is a noble pursuit, let me be very clear. I have a photo of my cat on my phone right now that I would share with you. Oh, there it is. Actually, you're not going to be able to see. If you want, after the talk, come around, I'll show you a photo of my cat. <laughs> it is disrupting so many of these things. And that is, it is a verb that everyone throws around and, and has been reduced to not meaning anything. But the core takeaway here is the fact that every one of us is still trying to figure out how to hack it. And all of those conventions 
that were how things were done are being questioned. And they're not going to be questioned by people who have always been part of the status quo because they come in with biases. They come in with an idea of this is how things are done. And we don't. Generally speaking, we come into this fresh-faced, wide-eyed, and thinking, well, you know what? Things are a little crappy right now on an economic level, right? Around the country, there are all kinds of things that we'd like to be able to solve. And a lot of the promises that we've been told, right? Go to school, pay your tuition, get the student loan, don't worry, it'll be fine. You'll have a job afterwards, it's being challenged. And we all sit here, as people who are part of the startup community, as people incredibly fortunate, because while so many of our peers are trying to figure out what the fuck they're gonna do because they're history majors who don't have an engineering friend, they meet their freshman year of college while playing video games that they can ride the coattails of. <laughs> really. <laughs> they're figuring out what to do. And so we have an incredible opportunity, and I'd even go so far as to say a responsibility to make the most out of this. Because the rest of this country, the rest of this world is still trying to figure this shit out. And we are in the best position to actually be creating that future. And hopefully it's a more equitable one. Hopefully it's a better one for artists. Hopefully it's a better one for musicians, for filmmakers. Hopefully it's a better one for teachers. Hopefully it's a better one for politicians who really need some disruption. Now, all of this stuff, all of this stuff, I need to, again, just put an asterisk on. Because you're hearing it from a guy who admits he also still doesn't know what the fuck he's doing. All right? But be comfortable in that. Relish that you still don't know. And I think that's where all of the really awesome stuff starts happening. So I want to go in the weeds and I want you guys to ask me shit about Reddit, Hitmunk, Breadpig, whatever you want, and I'll answer it. Um, but I wanted to get that out of the way because I figured if I have a captive audience of, you know, the people who are building the future in the greatest city in America, not here. I mean, this is lovely. <laughs> this is lovely. I was talking about New York, though. Uh, I should take advantage of it. So, so thank you guys for hearing me. And uh, please, ask away.